Thanks for attending my session at Service Mesh Con EU 2021. In this talk, we're going to take a look at adopting a service mesh in an enterprise organization and some of the challenges and things to look out for. This is intended to be a 101, 201 level talk. This is not a deep dive or anything advanced. For those, you know, you can take a look at some of the other talks that I've done in the past or blogs or books that I've written and, uh, and webinars that I've done. So my name is Christian Posta. I'm a field CTO here at Solo.io. We work with organizations around the world, large ones, small ones, adopting Istio-based technology and deploying that into production at high scale to build out their application networking architecture. I've written books on this and, and been discussing this and been involved in the Istio community since uh, the very beginning. And although this talk won't be an Istio per talk per se, it, it will pop up since that's what we, we do here at, uh, at Solo. Our typical challenges are around, or, or customer challenges that we work with are around modernization and going to a application architecture that better supports moving faster and delivering features, delivering things uh, more quickly using public cloud, private cloud to do that. Service Mesh is a piece of that puzzle. Service Mesh solves the problems of how applications communicate with each other. And in a typical organization, we see not just the modernization efforts around either building new services, using new tools, new architectures, or bringing along older or, or more legacy systems, monolithic, and trying to split them, rewrite them, and integrating with the rest of the organization. All right, so how do we connect services in a heterogeneous environment like this and solve the problems of service discovery, load balancing, timeouts, retry circuit breaking, the resilience aspects of uh, application networking, things like security, things like observability, and do this in a way that is cloud friendly. And what I mean by that is API, APIs to... Um, programmatically control this at runtime, knowing that the underlying infrastructure is dynamic and is ephemeral. All right, so Service Mesh plays a role in helping to facilitate solving this type of problem. The, the problem that we're gonna look at is deploying microservices into dynamic infrastructure and getting those things to communicate with each other. That itself is a complex problem. Using a service mesh to solve that simplifies some areas of that, but it's not a holistic jump in and adopt everything type proposition. So the way we work with our organizations is to slowly adopt that. First of all, determine whether or not you need this type of technology, but then to slowly adopt that using a crawl, walk, run type methodology. But getting this sort of infrastructure into, into place can really enable an organization to achieve its technical goals, which then leads to better business outcomes. And so that's where the fly part starts to come in. So the first thing you need to ask yourself is, do you need a service mesh? Well, only you can answer that really. Are you building a microservices style architecture? Are you using multiple frameworks and multiple languages? Microservices themselves, that's a complicated field. So you may hear that service mesh is complicated, Kubernetes is complicated. Well, we're dealing with a foundationally complicated topic. Now, if you're going to containers and you're leveraging some of this dynamic uh, infrastructure, that you know, may necessitate a, a solution like service mesh. If you're doing things like RPC type um, interactions with your, between your services using different frameworks, uh, you know, making updates to how these policies are, are enforced or written, you may need to look at uh, some sort of automation that can do this. So service Mesh can help. And then, of course, if you're getting out to a large set of services, individual teams owning their own services, and you need a platform uh, approach to solving these problems consistently, then you, might, you may look at using a Service Mesh uh, for that. Things to keep out, keep an eye out for if you're not there yet, is 
you know, the, the number of services of, uh, that you're trying to support, especially if they're heterogeneous, different languages, different frameworks, um, you know, being able to consistently understand what's happening on the network by capturing golden signals, uh, requests failing, how long they're taking, uh, whether circuit breaking is open, opening up, or how many retries are happening between services, and trying to detect what's happening uh, on the network in a consistent way, not leaving it up to each application developer to, well, maybe they exposed the right telemetry signals, maybe they didn't. And then at the end of the day, just like any other technology, you want to pick a handful of high value use cases and start to go down the path and iterate. All right, we like things like Kubernetes, things like Istio, they provide a lot, a lot of functionality and they touch a lot of different parts of the organization. But the, you know, the focus of start small and iterate, pick a particular use case. Some of these are the, the typical use cases that people start with. They want security, they have compliance issues, they, uh, data in flight needs to be encrypted. Uh, services communicating with each other need to know and validate that they are indeed the services they, they believe they are. Um, they need to build things to be a little bit more resilient with timeouts and retries and circuit breaking and so on, do that in a consistent fashion. These are some of the top use cases. So let's take a look at what this journey entails. Let's start with, I don't want to say obvious, but you know, uh, it becomes very clear as soon as you start digging into these types of solutions. There will be a learning curve. There will be a learning curve in terms of how your particular organization adopts this technology, just like maybe you did and went through with Kubernetes. All right, so these types of tools where you're blending infrastructure and developer concerns require different parts of the organization to come together and, um, and, and figure it out together. Ideally, you will have a foundational um, platform in place. You will uh, have automation in place, things like your CI CD or any of the custom automation that you've needed to build to get your platform to work. Um, you would ideally have a telemetry collection system or some, some some place where you're uh, storing time series based metrics and able to do dashboarding and, and that kind of stuff. Once you start to kick the tires on a particular service mesh or you choose one, then you will want to understand the underlying data plane technology, the proxies that are actually on the request path. It's a very important step in adopting a service mesh. To some, when they start exploring, the, the mesh, the data plane may seem like a black box. In some cases, for example, Istio or with Envoy, or the, I guess the Envoy-based service meshes, there's, there's a lot to glean from Envoy. Envoy is a, is a white box. There's a lot of stuff that gets exposed and, uh, and you can leverage to understand what exactly is happening on the network. You know, when we work with our customers and uh, users in the community, we typically tend to see either people do this on their own or we recommend it anyway, starting with the edge first. So you want to build a service mesh where services are communicating with each other. They're using these data plane proxies. Start with ingress. Start with one proxy, not 500. And un use that as an opportunity. First of all, it's a well-understood pattern. Use that as an opportunity. If you put it at, at the ingress or sort of an API ga gateway layer, use that as an opportunity to understand the data plane thoroughly, how to debug it, how to troubleshoot it, and so on, how to integrate that particular piece and the control plane pieces with your automation, with your uh, observability systems. And that should be kind of the, the way you tiptoe into adopting a service mesh. So starting at the edge, again, familiar uh, in ingress pattern. You don't, if, for example, using Istio, you don't need to use the sidecar proxies just to get the, uh, the traffic ingress routing at the edge. You can just start using the edge and route out to any services. Now, as you start to refine this, maybe you want to uh, expand this out to uh, different clusters or different uh, infrastructure footprints that you may have. You may find that this, uh, this uh, proxy or ingress gateway pattern 
starts to build up a layer or two and uh, you may isolate different boundaries, either different applications or different clusters or different organizational units following this, this same ingress uh, pattern. And you start to see a mesh of edge gateways start to form. And you know, from here, now you can start to push, to continue to push those proxies down into your infrastructure um, and start to get the benefits of the service-to-service -service communication. So let me pause here for a second and let's just come over and uh, take a look at a quick demo. Hopefully everything is set up the way I expect. So what we're gonna do here is we are going to maybe take a look at an existing set of services that we may have. We have a Kubernetes cluster, a handful of services that are deployed. In this case, the, the web API calls the recommendation service, which then calls the purchase history service. So you can see these pods running here in our Kubernetes cluster. We don't have any service mesh installed. We're going to install a service mesh, Istio in this case, and we'll give it a second to go through the installation process and bootstrapping of the, uh, of the, of the control plane. Let's see if we can do a kubectl get pod Istio system and see whether it's coming up, should be coming up. Let's also take a look at, uh, for this demo, we need to, we need our cloud provider to cooperate with us and try to give us an external IP so we can actually make calls. So what we have installed, if we come over here and look at the top pane, we've installed the control plane for our service mesh. And then we've also installed the ingress gateway. And so this is an example of starting small, right? We have our ingress gateway, we have our control plane, and that's all we really need to get started. We finally do have our external IP. So let's, let's carry on. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna expose one of our services, the, the web API service, onto the ingress gateway. So Clients from outside the cluster can call in. So let's apply these resources, how you do it in, in Istio. We'll give that a second. And then when we make a call using curl in this case, we should be able to get routed to our service. And we see that, that we do in this case. Web API calls recommendation. There's some sample services here, which calls purchase history. All right, so that's, that's all good. We can also do things, Istio, for example, or Envoy has out of the box things like Jot validation, um, some other you know, TLS termination, those types of things. And we can apply that to our, our edge gateway and still get start to, start to get value from it. If you're, if you're trying to go a full-blown API gateway where you need transformation, you may need uh, complex uh, um, usage policies based around rate limiting, you need things like uh, OIDC and LDAP and you know more, more advanced security features. Look at something like uh, a Glue Edge, which is also based on Envoy and, uh, and delivers more API gateway functionality. So, all right, so that's the, that's the uh, crawl part of our, our journey. We're just stepping our, our, putting our toes into the service mesh world. Now, once we've gotten a little bit past that, we get to the, the walk part where you want to start giving out or allowing different teams to use the functionality of the service mesh. Like I said, client-side load balancing, service discovery, timeouts, retries, circuit breaking, automated security, um, policy enforcement, and so on. So you need to start to identify what, what teams and what roles make up the, uh, the, the different groups that will be using and consuming technology like this, and how are we going to expose it to them? Are we gonna give them the Istio APIs directly or your respective service mesh APIs directly? In general, those are kind of complicated. Um, are we going to build a, an API, your own, or, or tie in with your own existing automation? Right, so there's, there's a handful of things to explore there. When you roll out the sidecar proxies to your applications, you're hoping to do this in a transparent way. 
you should test that because we've run into so many different uh, use cases where this is not the case. Application uh, you know, comes up first, starts to try to make a connection to the outside world, the sidecar proxy is not ready yet, starts to fail. The application can't handle the failure, it wasn't built for that, so pod recycles. Same thing happens, right? You get this, uh, this crash looping. Or the opposite, right? A service is uh, being spun down for some reason, and the proxy comes down first, but it was, there's still live connections going, the applications can't handle that. So explore exactly what transparent means to you and your application. These are typically, when we're migrating or modernizing, these are typically imperfect cloud applications and you know, figuring out how the service mesh will behave with those applications is, uh, is part of the walking part of this, this, this journey. Uh, like I said, iteratively take advantage of the features start to roll out the service proxies, enabling things like telemetry collection. So your, your Prometheus, your Datadog, scrape the, uh, the telemetry from these proxies and, uh, and, and start to build uh, security policies. And all the while, build up your skills around debugging the, the configuration issues that you might run into. Or you have the proxies in place and things start to go wrong. Things are slow. Things are failing. You know, how do you actually debug the network in that case? Uh, and then, of course, any day two operation of a service mesh includes being able to upgrade that service mesh with zero downtime. All right, so let's take a very quick look at how we might roll out um, uh, a service mesh into our existing services. Right, so we have our existing services. We don't have any, any service mesh deployed, no sidecar proxies deployed here. And what we're gonna do is if we call from the sleep service to the web API service, we see that, that it works, the communication works here. So now what we might do if we have automatic injection available for our, our service mesh, we may start to slowly and iteratively, notice this common theme, bring workloads into the mesh. And so in this case, anytime we make a change to our application, we want to treat it uh, very carefully. We want to treat it as a, as a canary or do a slow rollout. In this case, we're making a change to our application because we're injecting the sidecar. Maybe we haven't made any changes to the source code, but we've injected the sidecar. So now we have, in this case, two replicas of, uh, of the Web API service, but only one of them has the sidecar. So in this case, we would uh, do some tests, do some smoke tests, make sure that everything continues to function and look fine, and it sure does. So then we'll continue rolling out the, uh, the, the various services that we have. In this case, we'll, we'll speed it up. Um, we'll speed it up so that all of the services end up uh, slowly, you know, we're fast forwarding what would otherwise be a slow canary rollout of every service where we slowly introduce the the service proxy. All right, and we follow the same model for doing things like enabling mutual TLS. There's another thing that we run into with uh, some of these organizations where they have services uh, communicating with each other and they wanna enable mutual TLS. And for the services in the mesh, we can do that with things like a permissive mutual TLS policy where if both sides uh, are, are able to do mutual TLS, then we'll do mutual TLS. Otherwise, if there is our legacy services that are plain text, then we'll still continue to accept plain text. But then there are things you can do to slowly roll that, the plain text services out and phase them out. And you can do things like monitoring and checking, are there any services communicating over plain text? And then at some point say, all right, no more plain text, everything's gonna be uh, mutual TLS. Um, everything will be encrypted in the system. But that's, a, again, a slow phase rollout. Let's come back here. So that's the walk, right? So we, we've um, laid some of the foundational pieces. We've started to roll out the proxies. Now we want to start, we want to start moving. We want to get this out into the organization. It provides a lot of value to the organization. But we can't leave behind some of our existing policies we can't leave behind some of our existing infrastructure, like VMs, and we can't forget that uh, out of the box, 
a service proxy might not do exactly everything that a particular organization needs. And then there's other things, right? That uh, we have uh, regulatory uh, reasons to build out multiple clusters or isolate certain groups from others. And uh, you know, doing this in a secure fashion are all parts of, you know, now we're expanding, now we're growing, now we're bringing the rest of the organization into, uh, into this platform and uh, doing things like uh, deploying sidecar proxies into VMs, treating those as first class citizens in the rest of the mesh. Um, when traffic leads, leaves a mesh, forcing it through a particular egress point where you can apply policies and uh, security extensions and, and these other things. And then, as I mentioned, extensibility in the proxy is key. And uh, for Envoy-based service meshes like Istio, you can do something, uh, you can write customizations to the proxy using WebAssembly. That's what we're gonna take a quick look at here. So if we come, if we do, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna augment or enhance the data planes in a particular request flow with WebAssembly. We've written a WebAssembly module that basically in, enhances the headers in a response to a particular service. So if I call a service in our cluster from sleep to let's say the review service, review service gives us some JSON response. We can see the response headers look like this. What we wanna do, let's say some team expects a hello world header <laughs> that needs to be returned in the response. Let's take a look at what that would be or how we would do that. So with WebAssembly, we can do that by packaging up, by, so we can write the, the extension in whatever language we want, package that up into a WebAssembly module, deploy that into some OCI registry and share it with everyone. And then you need a way of pulling it down and installing it into your service mesh. Here's one example where we've already tagged a uh, existing WebAssembly extension. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, install it into a particular workload. In this case, uh, it's, um, we're gonna select a cluster and the workload where the, uh, the data plane might be running and we're gonna install our um, WebAssembly module into that. So let's cross our fingers and hopefully I set up this part of the demo correctly. No, I don't remember. Uh, all right, so we did that. Now let's check the status of this descriptor. Uh, all right, I think it looks okay. If we look at the status, we can see that it has been deployed. So now if we try to call that same service again and show the headers, we should see that indeed the, um, the, re the response has been enriched with this new capability. And so, Using WebAssembly to modify the request path or modify the, mes the messages in the request or do things like implement backwards compatible security protocols and so on that your organization might have is extremely powerful and allows you to continue to scale out and, and roll the mesh out to various parts of your organization. The last part, now we're running, but the last part is now you have this mesh now it's, you know, you're bringing in the VMs, you've got your security policies in place, traffic is, you know, leaving the mesh through egress gateways correctly, everything looks good. Now what can you, what can you do? What does that give you? That gives you a tremendous amount of, uh, of power in your application network. So how services communicate with each other is not tied now to some centralized API management system. Everything is decentralized. It's not tied to big, expensive uh, hardware load balancers and difficult to change DNS and, and uh, tied to IP addresses and so on. When services communicate with each other, they can communicate with a global name and across clusters, across VMs, across clouds, the mesh is smart enough to say, all right, when service A is talking to service B, prefer service B locally or you know, service B is a little overloaded, so fail over to the next available uh, zone or fail over to a different region without the client having to know anything about this. All right, so now with, with federated, with, by treating this estate of, uh, of different service meshes as a federated unit, you can get extremely powerful network and, and routing uh, and, build, and then start to build things on top of that. 
And of course you want to expose this and allow all of your teams to leverage this capability. Um, and so doing that in a way that's isolated and secure for various tenants in your, in your organization is um, extremely powerful. So the use case that I'm describing is you made multiple clusters, multiple different types of infrastructure, but your services, they're simple. You, you focus on the business application or the, the business logic. What happens when you make a call on the network Service discovery is happening, client-side load balancing is happening, global service discovery and failover is happening, and you also get the uh, timeouts, retry, circuit breaking, all that stuff that, uh, that you know, um, augments and enhances an application and, and makes it uh, a better behaving citizen on the network. Um, and so this is extremely powerful. So this is what we work uh, with our customers at. Uh, here's an example of what a, what a deployment might look like to enable that or you have multiple clusters, maybe VMs, and, uh, and you're getting consistent configuration, consistent security policies, consistent service discovery and global load balancing uh, provided by, by this, uh, this federation. And so this journey that I just described is exactly what we work with our customers, our open source users here at solo.io. Um, and, uh, and, and so what I've just described comes from experience some pain as well, and uh, you know this is uh, this is stuff that people are starting to learn themselves, and we're seeing more and more successful deployments of service mesh at very large scales, uh, hundreds if not thousands of clusters and uh, and control planes. Uh, so that's all I have. Thanks for joining my session. Come chat with us. Um, go to the Solo Slack. It's a great place. A lot of resources about Envoy and uh, Istio and uh, some of the open source projects that we're building and the tooling that we're building on top of these things to simplify the usage and the operation of this type of technology and help you be successful. So I appreciate, again, you watching my talk. There's uh, a lot of other good talks, so go ahead and see them and, uh, and, and have a good day.